Hello and welcome to the next video on JDBM2. Today we'll be focusing on object serialization. This is a critical part of making your indexes efficient. We'll be exploring why this is the case, and then we'll be looking at how to actually implement a proper serialization mechanism through JDBM2. Now the first thing uh, to observe is that Java's native serialization methods which JDBM2 uses by default, have to be extremely redundant. This is because the entire object hierarchy that gets serialized needs to be reconstructed essentially entirely from scratch without any kind of external uh, support or external information uh, about what that class structure looks like. Because of this, Java has to store an extremely large amount of redundant information along with its normal, with the actual object data. As a consequence of this, the index files that get constructed end up being very, very large. Now recall, during the last video, we built a simple index construction mechanism. Let's run that. Build our indexes. As we saw, this creates a set of index files, myindex.dbf, myindex.dbr, and myindex.idf and idr. Of the eight files that get constructed, the actual index data is stored in a file called myindex.dbr.t. We can see this because it's the largest file that gets constructed. This file is a whopping 148 kilobytes of data. Now that's a lot, especially since the data file that it's built, being built out of is only 16 kilobytes. So, what's taking up so much space? In order to find that out, I'm going to use a utility called hexdump. Now hexdump has the ability to cleanly display a binary file. Dumps all of the data along with its hexadecimal character representations and tries to translate whatever textual data it can. So let's look here in the right column at what's going on. As we scroll through the file, a particular pattern keeps appearing. This fully qualified path name of datum appears many times. Now the reason for this is that as Java tries to serialize objects, it has to be able to reconstruct the entire object from scratch. It doesn't know whether the object has been subclassed. It doesn't know whether the object has fields with subclassed objects in them. As a consequence, every time it writes an object, every time it serializes an object, it has to put the fully qualified class name of the object. Now think about this. edu.buffalo.cse562.data.datum. That's about 15 to 20 characters worth of data. And that gets serialized with every single cell that we create. That's 15 to 20 additional characters attached to every integer, attached to every float, attached to every string. We can do better. Because we have the create table statements for every table, because we have the create index statements for every index, we know exactly what the schema of the data is. And as a consequence, we can actually do the serialization much more efficiently. So, how do we do that? Well, let's bring up the JDBM2 website. The documentation page, uh, as I've recently noticed, is a little bit out of date. So what I'm going to suggest that you do is go to the downloads page and download jdbm2.4-doc.zip, which contains the latest documentation. This file 
downloads into a standard javadoc directory. Let's have a look at JDBM's record manager. Recall last time we used the tree map method to construct a new primary B plus tree index. You'll note that there are several different instantiations of this method, one of which includes a reference to a class called Serializer. Serializer is a interface that allows us to define an external way to translate between an object and a byte string. And as you'll see, as you see, there is both a opening for a value serializer and a key serializer. In our case, both of these are the same, but we still need a way to define them. So let's look at the serializer class itself. Serializer includes two methods, deserialize and serialize. Serialize translates an object into a byte stream using this serializer output interface, and deserialize goes from a byte stream back to the original object. Let's have a look at each of these. Serializer input is a superclass of Java I.O. data input stream. This is a subclass, excuse me. Java I.O. data input stream has a set of very useful methods. Read boolean, read byte, read char. In fact, every primitive type has a read method, including string, read utf. Serializer output, similarly, has an equivalent method, set of methods, write boolean, write byte, write bytes, etc. So that's really how this works. You write to a data output stream, and the corresponding things come out of the data input stream. So let's see this in practice. Here I have the build indexes method from the last video. I've factored out the row entity into a separate index row class, otherwise it is identical. And I've started creating a template for the index row serializer that I'm going to construct. This implements the serializer interface, allowing us to serialize and deserialize index rows. Now you'll note that I've passed in the schema, or the set of types that I'm expecting to parse in and out, because we're going to need these in order to correctly decide which function we need to call on the serializer input method. Now, as we're deserializing, we know how wide the row is that we need to create, so we can create a new row that is the appropriate width. But then, how do we actually decide what to deserialize? Well, in order to answer that, we're first going to have to know how we're serializing the objects in the first place. So I've created a very simple serialize method here. As I said before, this works by calling write int, or write float, or write boolean, depending on the type of the object that I'm expecting to write. Now, this doesn't uh, cover every single type that I might want to construct, so I'm going to throw an exception if I encounter one of these types that I haven't properly handled. There's also a possibility that the datum that I get is not going to correspond to the type of the schema that I'm expecting. So that also will trigger an exception. So for integers, I write int. For floats, I write float. For booleans, I write boolean. With these entities in hand, I know exactly how to deserialize. Uh, my input method is going to expect that if the schema says integer, 
I should read an integer. If the schema says float, I should read a float, and so forth. Serializing strings is a little bit more tricky. Um, the string itself could be potentially of variable length, and there could be some strange characters in the string. Fortunately, data output stream gives us a nifty write UTF method, which handles all of this for us. The first two bytes of the string include a length field. That length field tells us how many bytes to read into that string. The corresponding read method is read UTF. Dates are also a little bit tricky because they actually consist of three different integers. I've extended my datum class with accessors for every individual component of the date, and I'm writing each of them as an integer. The corresponding read method involves three separate read integer methods. Now, I need to change my build indexes method as well. So you can see I have this tree map definition exactly as before, and I'm going to add two parameters to it. First, I'm going to add an instance of this index row serializer that I just created that accesses rows consisting of every single type in the orders table. So this, is go this types method is going to return to me an array consisting of integer, integer, string, float, date, string, string, integer, string. I also need a serializer for the key type. Because I'm hard coding the key to be the order key attribute, I'm going to create a serializer that expects a single integer, which is the type of order key. All right, that's pretty much it. So let's try it out. Going to recompile everything, clean up all of the index files, and rebuild the indexes. The indexes have been reconstructed. So let's see what's inside the new one. As you can see, all of those fully qualified class paths have gone away. And the records are stored much more tightly in this representation. And my index has now shrunken to 36 kilobytes, only slightly more than the raw unindexed data. I hope this has been helpful. Thank you and good luck.